Well, anyway, let's get our Bibles out this morning. It's so good to be with you. I'm sorry that my wife couldn't make it. We had a big women's event at our church this past week. And then she signed up for grandma duty this weekend. Uh, Our four kids have sired 11 grandkids. And here's the kicker. They're all 11 years old and under. So it's quite, a, quite an event at our house around Thanksgiving. It's quite fun. Anyway, let's get our Bibles out and let's turn to Genesis chapter 29. This morning I'd like to explore with you a story, an interesting story. We find it here in Genesis chapter 29. And we'll start by reading verses 1 through 20. Genesis 29, beginning in verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. Then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, oh, we know him. And so he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he looked. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now while he was speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, And the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the whale's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel, lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. And so she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And so he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, and so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And thank you for these couples, Lord, that have gathered this morning. And Lord, I recognize, I know you recognize, that they have set aside duties and tasks and responsibilities and sacrificed days off and have taken the time to come together to work on their marriage. Lord, I know you're going to bless that kind of effort. Lord, I know you're going to speak to us today. You're going to encourage the marriages in this room. Lord, I pray you would rain down your blessing upon them. Lord, fill them with your spirit. Fill them with love for each other. And give them some insights and some tools that they can apply to their relationship here today. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome to a love story. But a love story with a twist. A boy named Jacob leaves home to start a life and to find a wife. 
His journey leads him to a Middle Eastern watering hole in Haran, where he meets this gorgeous young shepherdess named Rachel. Verse 17 here in Genesis 29 refers to Rachel as beautiful of form and appearance. In other words, both her face and her figure were attractive. She was a cover girl working as a shepherd. She was stunningly beautiful. You could call her a a fox in sheep's clothing. (laughs) The stone that covered the opening of the well was huge and heavy. The shepherds usually waited on each other's arrival to water their flocks since it required a combined effort to move the stone. But on this day, Rachel arrived and verse 10 tells us, that Jake flexed his pecs and he moved the stone all by himself. Nothing like a macho demonstration of a little muscle to try and impress a girl. But apparently it worked, for we're told in verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel. You know, I've heard it said, a boy becomes a man when he discovers it's more fun to steal a kiss than second base. (laughs) Well, apparently a young Jacob is growing up. He plants a kiss on ravishing Rachel, and we're told in verse 11, Jacob lifted up his voice and wept. I read recently of a woman over in Alabama whose pet iguana stopped breathing. That's right, pet iguana. She had to give the slimy reptile mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Afterwards, she cried because she realized she had kissed the iguana Trust me, that is not why Jacob is crying here. His tears are tears of joy. He thinks that he has found the gal of his dreams. But beginning in verse 16, the plot thickens. Rachel takes her new boyfriend home to meet dad. And Jacob should have been warned. A young man fresh from mama's house was no match for a shrewd dude like Laban. Listen to what we're told in verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And here is the twist in our love story. For in Haran, as in parts of the Middle East to this very day, it was contrary to custom for the younger daughter to marry before her elder sister. Thus Leah was a roadblock in Jacob's plans to marry Rachel. And to make matters worse, The prospects of Leah marrying anytime soon seemed slim, for she had an awful problem. We're told in verse 17, Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now this phrase, Leah's eyes were delicate, it can mean one of two things. First, it can refer to the health of Leah's eyes. They were weak and squinted and perhaps even cross-eyed. Rachel had these deep, beautiful pools of blue, these mesmerizing eyes. Whereas her sister Leah had these little slits above her cheeks. I mean, awful looking eyes. But this phrase, Leah's eyes were delicate, can also be interpreted, Leah was a cause for sore eyes. That the poor girl was so ugly she made your eyes hurt when you looked at her. Either way, Rachel's sister Leah was not a very physically attractive young lady. Which reminds me, there's actually a woman's college in England. In the town of Ugly, England. And recently a spokeswoman for the institute was quoted as saying, We try to call ourselves the Women's Institute of Ugly, but the name never sticks. And I'm sure the women of the school are no doubt glad. But old Leah... She could have graduated magna cum laude from the Women's Institute of Ugly. Rachel was a sight for sore eyes, whereas Leah made your eyes sore. Well, when Laban offered Jacob a job and told him to set his own wages, Jacob makes an interesting request. Verse 18 reads, Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel your younger daughter. The length of time no doubt showed the depth of Jacob's love for Rachel and probably how long he thought it would take for Leah to marry first. Verse 19. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. 
So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. How beautiful is that? His love for Rachel made the time fly by. And I believe the willingness to wait is always a characteristic of true love. Well, verse 21 moves ahead seven years. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now, an oriental marriage feast lasted a whole week. So for seven days, the groom and his buddies partied hardy. I mean, that means by the time the wedding night rolled around, Jacob was probably sauced, maybe tanked. Verse 23 informs us, Now it came to pass in the evening that he, being Laban, took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob went into her. In addition to Jacob being inebriated, the brides in those days wore heavy veils and flowing robes. And since there were no electric lights in the honeymoon cottage, Jacob assumes that he was going to bed and consummating his marriage with his beloved Rachel. Verse 25 fast forwards about eight hours. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And it is hard to read that line with the same sense of disappointment Jacob must have felt. He had been stabbed in the back. For seven years he had worked hard to hold Rachel in his arms. Only now to be double crossed. What a betrayal. And he said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Well, again, Jacob kisses a girl and starts to weep. But this time for a much different reason. He has kissed the iguana. He has spent the night with old lizard eyes Leah. Now, in verse 26, Laban stuns Jacob with the answer. It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. And what an ironic twist of fate. For if you know your Old Testament, you'll recall that before leaving home, Jacob had stolen the rights of the firstborn from his older brother Esau. Jacob had spit in the eye of custom, and now custom was spitting back. Jacob, the deceiver, gets deceived. What goes around comes around. This is why honesty is always the best policy. Now, this Laban, he's a sly guy. He's a crafty bargainer himself. And so he makes Jacob an offer of his own. He says, fulfill her week, and we will give you this one, that is Rachel, also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Laban will give Rachel to Jacob now in return for another seven years of service. And Jacob agrees. Verse 30 tells us, Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. Never doubt Jacob's initial love for Rachel. He serves a total of 14 years for Rachel. But the question arises, what should Jacob have actually done after he woke up next to Leah? And it is my opinion that Jacob should have never married Rachel. Nowhere in the Bible does God approve of bigamy. A man was never meant to have multiple wives. In Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, our Lord Jesus himself lays out God's ideal for marriage. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. God's blueprint for marriage was for one man and one woman to remain in a lifetime relationship. God tolerated bigamy as he tolerates divorce today, but realize he never gave it his stamp of approval. In fact, even, even Jesus himself condemned bigamy. You remember the verse, 
Matthew 6, verse 24 tells us, no man can serve two masters. <laughs> Obviously, God never intended for a man to be married to two women. In fact, recently, Middle East archaeologists have unearthed a cuneiform tablet. The translators worked real hard to try to decipher the meaning of the tablet. As a matter of fact, it's entitled, The Top Ten Reasons No Man in His Right Mind Would Want Two Wives. And I actually have with me here the translation from the ancient Chaldean Semitic, right here, right here on this piece of paper. Here it is right now. Number 10, twice as many birthdays and anniversaries to remember. <laughs> Number nine, you have to pick who gets the second garage door opener. That could be difficult. Number eight, by the time two wives take a shower, there's no more hot water. <laughs> Number seven, who can afford two dozen roses on Valentine's Day? That'll set you back. Number six, when it's time to choose, it's now two against one. Number five, this is my favorite, your one drawer and half a foot of closet space gets cut in half. Number four, two wives would be frowned on at the Calvary Chapel marriage conference. Number three, two honeydew lists. Number two, this is where it gets a little dicey. Two mother-in-laws. And the number one reason no man in his right mind would want two wives. PMS twice a month? Well, apparently, Jacob never read this top ten list, for if he had, he would have added one more reason why two wives are not a good idea. They might not get along. Just read ahead here. Jacob's family became a sordid example of infighting and envy and ugliness and bitterness and hatred and deception and resentment and manipulation. In fact, later when Rachel names one of her maid sons, she calls him Naphtali, or my wrestling. And she says, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. See, Jacob lived, and his kids were raised in the middle of two warring women. This was not a happy home. The story reminds me of an Italian fellow who was getting married. The ceremony happened to be outdoors, right next to the ocean. And on the day of the wedding, a heavy fog rolled in. In fact, the cloud was so thick that he couldn't see what he was doing, and he accidentally married two women. When asked to explain himself, he said, Well, it was a bigger mist. <laughs> it was a bigger mist. <laughs> and so was Jacob. He, too, was a bigger mist. I believe Jacob should have never married Rachel. He should have left with Leah and learned to be content. But I can hear some of you saying, come on, Sandy, the girl was ugly as mud and he didn't even love her. How can you say he should have left with Leah? Well, hear ye, hear ye. I believe that even if Jacob didn't love her, if the two of them had conducted their marriage God's way, Jacob would eventually love Leah every bit as much as he initially loved Rachel. For love grows when marriage is done God's way. Sounds funny saying it, but the feeling of love is a far overrated ingredient when it comes to success in marriage. Oh, it's important in courtship, but in marriage it's way overblown. Successful marriages are built on commitment and sacrifice, not simply feelings. I've seen marriages where the love was depleted, but the husband and wife decided to stick it out and do things God's way, and love started to grow again. On the other hand, I've seen marriages abounding in loving feelings, but the couple ignored God's wisdom, and the feelings dwindled as the marriage broke apart. See, if you wanted to plant a garden, and you had the best seed available, yet you buried that seed in sorry, scorched, superficial soil, I don't care how good the seed might be, it would fail to germinate in the sorry soil. Yet if I had inferior seed, but fertile and nutritious and moist dirt, even the sick seed would grow in the healthy soil. And so it is in marriage. 
Give me two people that can't stand each other and encourage that couple to interact God's way and love will grow out of nowhere. I have seen it happen. In his letter to his daughter, author Charlie Shedd, he passes on some important advice. He says, marriage is not so much finding the right person as it is being the right person. Let me repeat that. It's worth the price of admission. Marriage is not so much finding the right person as it is being the right person. Oh, the dating game emphasizes finding the right person and relying on chemistry to cement the marriage. But what happens when the chemistry dries up? Well, we blame our former Mr. or Mrs. Wright. He or she must not have been the right one after all. We remind ourselves there are other fish in the sea. We throw back our current spouse and we rebate our hook. Some of us keep kissing frogs thinking we'll finally find our prince or our princess. It never dawns on some people that the problem just might be them. I honestly believe you can take a man and a woman who've never seen each other but are determined to do marriage God's way. The man willing to love his wife as Christ loves the church and the woman willing to follow her husband as the church is to follow Christ. Each of them caring and serving and showing compassion and giving of their time and sharing their hearts and living their lives for each other. You put those two people together and they'll end up happily married. Actually, this is what happened to Jacob and Leah. As we were told in verse 30, in the beginning, Jacob loved Leah, loved Rachel more than Leah. But there is strong evidence that slowly over time, Jacob's initial feelings changed. In fact, we're told later in the chapter, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And at first, your heart just breaks for Leah, doesn't it? She's always longing for Jacob's love. Notice what happens next. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son. And said, now this time my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Obviously, old Leah kept laboring to make her marriage better. All that's mentioned here of her efforts are her three labors. But I'm sure she labored in many other ways as well. Finally, verse 35 tells us, And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which means praise. Then she stopped bearing. The implication is that all her effort paid off with the birth of Judah. She now praises God. Finally, her desires have been fulfilled. At last, she experiences the enjoyment and the security of marital love and no longer feels the need to bear another child. Now, when you jump ahead to the end of Jacob's life, you find him making an interesting choice. In Genesis 49, he is lying on his deathbed. And with his last breath, Jacob makes a dying request. He cries out, bury me in the cave where they buried Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and where I buried Leah. You would have thought Jacob would want his final resting place to be next to Rachel in Bethlehem. But oh no, he asked to be buried in Mamre alongside Leah. You see, on the first night of their marriage, Jacob resented lying next to Leah. But at the end of their road together, it was his utmost desire. Jacob wanted to make sure that until the day of the resurrection, that his bones would lie next to Leah's. Apparently, his heart had turned. It's ironic, but Rachel died prior to Leah. Thus, Leah was the wife who ended up with Jacob all to herself. It was Jake and Leah who enjoyed growing old together. It's also interesting that it's through Leah, not Rachel, that Judah was born. The Messiah came through the tribe of Judah. Thus, Jesus was of the lineage of Leah, 
not Rachel. Perhaps that was God's way of putting his stamp of approval on the union between Jacob and Leah. Their offspring was the link in the royal line. In the beginning, we're told, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. But in the end, the roles reversed. Old lizard-eyed Leah became Jacob's beloved. On that awful morning, when Jacob awoke to discover he was lying next to Leah, that he had been double-crossed, he didn't seek an annulment. He realized that with God, there are no accidents. God is sovereign. Nothing happens that he does not at least allow. Jake accepted his wife and built a life with Leah. You know, perhaps you've always felt that your marriage began as somewhat of a double cross. She was pregnant and you felt it was your duty. Her home life had soured and your good job made for a convenient escape. Your marriage was expected. You were pressured. You both were too young. You weren't seeking God at the time. Hey, you need to realize just as Jacob did, none of that matters. For marriage is sacred. Its vows are binding. In God's plan, friend, once you say I do, you did. In his sovereignty, God allowed the two of you to marry. The Almighty could have stopped it. The pastor could have come down with laryngitis. A lightning bolt could have struck the church minutes before you walked down the aisle. But God chose to let it happen. The deed is now done. Now it's up to you to accept your marriage as God's will and make the best of it. You remember that old song from the 70s? I think it was written by Stephen Stills. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Hey, that's biblical. (laughs) Well, sort of biblical, I guess. But I know this is biblical. If you really love the one you're with the way God wants you to love them, you won't desire anyone else. You might be stuck with a Leah, but if you let him, God can turn your Leah into a lover. You know, years ago, prior to first teaching this passage at our church, you know, I prayed. I said, Lord, what a sordid mess. Deception and bigamy and constant infighting. What a terrible marriage. How can I possibly apply this sour situation to the marriages there at Calvary Chapel? Well, I believe the Lord gave me a figurative application that speaks to us today. I know it goes a bit beyond the context, but it's not unbiblical in what it teaches. Here it is. I believe that just like Jacob, every married person in this room today is, in a sense, married to two people. That's right. You're married to two people. If you're a man, you're married to both a Leah and a Rachel. If you're a woman, you're married to both a Lee and a Ray. (laughs) Now hear me out. You're just like Jacob. Every married person here today is wedded to a Rachel. See, this is the part of your spouse that you love, that you are attracted to, that you adore. This is the person who fires your engines, man. You could be forced to wait on this Rachel for seven long years, and your love for her would cause it to seem but a few days. But (laughs) you're also married to Aaliyah. And this is the part of your spouse that was a surprise. For when you married your mate, you knew you were getting Rachel, but you didn't know about this Leah. (laughs) Lee is the ornery, ugly, selfish side of that man. Leah is the side of your spouse that was covered up and hidden and veiled before the vows were taken. Oh yes, we are also hitched to a Leah. See, in every marriage, there are mornings Just like the day after Jacob's wedding night, when you roll over and you look at your spouse, hoping to see Rachel, but instead you cry, oh no, it is Leah. I have kissed the iguana. See, you need to come to terms with the truth. There is a Leah and a Rachel living side by side in every spouse. 
It's been noted, in rural Japan, a man's wife is chosen by his parents, and he doesn't know her until after the wedding. Though the custom in America is completely different, the end result is the same. (laughs) And it's true. I don't care how long you date a person before you marry, whether it's seven months or seven years or 17 years, you never learn all there is to know about your spouse. Believe me, there will definitely be some surprises after the wedding day. See, there are aspects of your spouse that resemble Leah. And hey, the blemishes were there from the beginning. Oh, but you were drunk on love and you didn't see them. See, your spouse is not what you thought. And it's a shock when you realize it. And so the question becomes, what do you do with a Leah or with a Lee? Well, the first morning after Jacob saw her, he complained to Laban. But what did he do the next morning or the next or the morning after he had left Laban's house? Well, here's what Jacob does. Let me read you verse 31 again. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Jacob began to see that the fruitfulness in his life was coming from Leah, not Rachel. That the offspring, the growth, the real fruit was being supplied by Leah. Oh yeah, for a while there, Rachel was still his choice for a good time. I mean, at first, she was certainly the wife he took to the company functions to make a good impression with the boss. But over time, Jacob realized that God's blessing was more on Leah than on the trophy wife. God was using Leah more than Rachel to grow Jacob and his family. Surprisingly, spiritual life and fruitfulness came more from old sore eyes than from the cover girl. And here is the application to our lives, to our marriages. It's often the rough edges, the ugly traits, the ornery attitudes in your spouse that cause you to grow and mature spiritually. When I'm loving and sensitive and compassionate, I console, I encourage my wife, I minister to her. Oh, but when I test her patience and push her kindness, and tax her endurance, and stretch her faith, I force her to trust in the Lord, and Jesus ministers to her. You could put it like this. When Sandy's on his best behavior, he causes Kathy to glow. But when Sandy is less than his best, he causes Kathy to grow. Fruitfulness flowed into Jacob's life through ugly Leah rather than through gorgeous Rachel. And the fruit of God's spirit will flow into our lives when our spouse's blemishes force us to draw upon the Lord. When my wife looks to me and I cause sore eyes, it forces her to look to Jesus and she gets blessed. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that there are no limits to our acceptance of a spouse's behavior. For example, I don't believe that a married person should ever stand idly by and bear with a promiscuous or an abusive spouse. These are not the traits that Leah represents. When a person tolerates a beating or a cheating, it makes them an accomplice to the crime. You become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Now here's my point this morning. I'm simply suggesting that you learn to accept your spouse's humanness. Leah couldn't help the fact she was ugly. And I'm sure she did the best with what she had. She styled her hair and applied lots and lots of makeup and bought lots and lots of beautiful veils. I'm sure she tried. And likewise, all married folks should try to be the best that they can be. But the real breakthrough in this relationship came when Jacob learned to accept his wife unconditionally. See, we all should want to please our spouse and glorify God. But we need to face the fact that no matter how hard we try, none of us is ever going to be perfect. Leah turned out to be a diamond in the rough. But Jacob didn't see or appreciate her beauty until he gave up trying to change her and accepted his situation. It's a wise man, a wise woman, who stops trying to change their Leah or their Lee. 
I heard someone say, the only time a woman succeeds in changing a man is when he's a baby. <laughs> or women marry men expecting to change them, while men marry women thinking they will never change. Both get disappointed. <laughs> Husband, wife, it is not for you to change your spouse. Your job is to love your spouse. God will change your spouse if he or she needs to be changed. I heard a wonderful story of a wife whose husband bought her a brand new car. She was maneuvering in the mall parking lot when she had an accident. And it was her fault. She worried about her husband's reaction. When the police arrived, they asked to see her proof of insurance. And so she opened up the glove box. And along with the insurance card, she found a note. And when she read it, it made her cry. Well, the policeman asked her what was wrong. All she could do, she was crying and weeping. All she could do was just hand him the note. It was from her husband, and it read, Honey, in case of an accident, remember it's you I love, not the car. Here's a husband who decided in advance to simply love his Leah. This is how you turn a Leah into a lover. You accept him or her, for better or worse. You love your spouse for who they are, warts and all, sore eyes or not. Once a hillbilly wife commented on her wedding vows. She told her friend, she said, them there vows say for better or worse. Because he ain't going to get no better, and he sure can't get no worse. So I take him as is. Hey, Leah was probably as ugly the day Jake buried her as the day he married her. But along the way, Jacob learned to accept her as is. And this is what each of us needs to do for the Leah in our spouse. You see, unconditional acceptance is the miracle cure. It frees up the Leah in a person from the pressure and the insecurity of never measuring up. And trust me, we are always better and more lovable when we know we can be ourselves and we'll still be accepted. And it also frees up the Jacob in us from allowing impossible expectations to hang a constant cloud of disappointment and failure over our marriage. You see, the Jake in all of us needs to stop mourning over what ain't and what can't and start enjoying again what is. We get so fixated on the 10% negative in our spouse, we forget the 90% positive, all that we still love about them. We forget Leah and Rachel live side by side. On her 50th wedding anniversary, a wife shared the secret to her long, happy marriage. She said, on my wedding day, I decided to make a list of 10 of my husband's faults, which for the sake of our marriage, I would overlook. Well, a guest asked, what 10 faults did you list? The lady shrugged. She said, well, to tell you the truth, I never got around to listing them. But whenever my husband did something that made me hop and mad, I'd say to myself, lucky for him, that's one of the 10. <laughs> Forgiveness, mercy, patience, kindness, acceptance, tolerance, gentleness, compassion. That's all stuff that we as Christians are supposed to be good at, isn't it? And you see, these are also the ingredients that transform a Leah into a lover. See, each one of us wants and expects our mate to accept the Leah in us. But this morning, why don't you ask God to help you accept the Leah in her? Husband, don't you think it's time to give your wife a break? She does the best she can. Those kids are so demanding. Her job is never over. She needs your time and your attention. And wife, don't you think it's time to cut your husband some slack? I mean, my, the old boy has come a long way. He's at a marriage conference today. Can you imagine? <laughs> he carries a lot of responsibility. He loves you and those kids. And he wants to be a godly man. Why don't you support him, even when he doesn't do all that you'd like him to do? See, each married person here has a choice. We can focus on the thorns that are on our rose or the rose that's among our thorns. 
Our cup is either half empty or half full. It's up to us. If you want to have a fruitful marriage, then the two of you need to decide to simply love your Leah. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I pray for all the couples here today. Please bless them, Lord. Lord, please bless them abundantly. Please work in their hearts today. Lord, unconditional love is truly the miracle cure. May we love each other as Jesus has loved us. And in his name we pray, amen.